Let's rise up as we pray. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord. That the word of God will enrich your life tonight. That God will help you to honor his name. And to show respect for the word of the Lord. That the word of God that comes to you day after day will not come in vain. That the grace God gave you at the beginning when you became saved. That grace will continue in your life and that grace will continue to increase. And that the nearer you draw near to the time of the end, to the time of the coming of the Lord, the more you'll be conscious of greater grace coming upon your life. That you'll be a good example to members of the church. That as you see the light of the gospel in your own life, you'll be drawn closer to the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And are the people around you who do not read their Bible? Or do not understand their Bibles Looking at your life They will see the Bible Clearly demonstrated Clearly explained And what they do not understand Of the requirement of the Lord in the Bible they will understand as they look at your life, as they read the word in your life. And your life will be a demonstration of the truth of the word of God. Let's pray that what you yourself, what you are teaching, you are teaching other people. In the zone, in the house fellowship, in the district, in the various sections where God has privileged you to be a leader, that none of us will be like the Pharisees who teach, but they do not have the grace to be obedient to the word they teach. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to you tonight as dear children, precious children, those who desire in honoring the Heavenly Father, who want your will to be done in our lives. We are praying, O oh Lord, as we come today, we'll see you again on the throne. With all that you have done for us, all that you have given to us, we'll be able to respond to you in a way that pleases you, in a way that glorifies you, in a way that so honors and pleases you that every time there will be the witness of the Spirit in our hearts, that these are the children you are well pleased in. Lord, we pray that all that we hear from day to day, from week to week, will not fall on deaf ears, and will not get into stony hearts and stony ground, but it will fall into prepared hearts, willing to be obedient to your word, willing to do what you want us to do, that, Lord, you alone, will be the focus of our hearts, our lives, our actions, our ambition, our desires, 
everything that we stand for be with us today lord continue to be glorified in our lives in jesus name we pray We're looking at First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading verse 5 and reading verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. If you come to verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shoot forth the presence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You'll find as you look at verse 5, ye as lively stones, living stones. To start with, as it comes to mention life, stones that live. It tells you then a radical change has taken place already. Because we're told that as sinners, who are dead in sins and trespasses, and to be quickened by the Spirit of God, by the power of the resurrection of Christ, that we have turned away from sin, and we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and because of repentance and faith in the Lord, we are quickened and made alive. And we're no more dead stones that we used to be. We've not become new creatures in Christ. And the life in Christ and the life of Christ has come into us. And so life has come. And so he addresses us as lively or living stones. Then it says, we built up a spiritual house. Which means then the Lord is not interested in having us as isolated, disjointed, scattered stones. He wants us to be built up into a beautiful temple, a holy sanctuary unto the Lord, where the Lord himself will be able to dwell. And he calls us now, the totality of the congregation, or the group, or the assembly, of the people of God, of the people that are born again. He says we're now lively stones, living stones, built up. Joined together, a spiritual temple, a spiritual house, a spiritual sanctuary. But then he says in that verse 5, we are not just stones, we are priests unto the Lord. And as priests unto the Lord, we are to offer something unto him. And then he qualifies the priesthood. He says it's an holy priesthood. What a wonderful thing as we come to know the Lord. And we realize that as a body of believers, and especially as a leadership, leading the body of believers, we're supposed to be an holy priesthood. And you understand that this is coming from the Old Testament revelation. And in the Old Testament revelation, you know what the priests were. You know what the Levites were. You know what the sons of Aaron were. I know what Aaron and the descendants of Aaron, what they were. In their service to the Lord, every minute detail was so outlined, step after step, detail after detail, and point after point. And, and just one word you can think about is the consecration of the priesthood. The consecration, in fact, that's the exact word that was used. That Aaron and his sons 
and the Levites will be consecrated unto the Lord. And then as you think about the consecration of the priesthood, you are thinking about the submission of the priesthood unto the Lord. You cannot talk about the consecration of the priesthood without talking about the submission of that priesthood. So as you look at the Old Testament and you begin to ask yourself, what are the things required today? Of the people of God Of the leadership in the church Then you throw your mind back To the very fact that now Not just the leadership alone But the whole membership Of the church of the living God Those who have received The life of Christ in them They are referred to as lively stones They are referred to as Holy priesthood unto the Lord and so then, as you see yourself as part of this holy priesthood, you want to be consecrated to the Lord, and you want to be submissive to the Lord. And it says, it is to offer. Come back again to the Old Testament. All the offerings of the priests were so identified, described in detail. That if anybody offered anything, any priest offered anything different from what had been stipulated in the word that they were to offer to the Lord, there was the penalty of death. You remember the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. In offering strange fire before the Lord. And you bring yourself back to the fact that now we're the priests of the Lord. And we're the holy priesthood. And we're to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Spiritual sacrifices. And the Lord looks at our sacrifices. Are they carnal sacrifices? Are they selfish sacrifices? Are they fleshly sacrifices? Are they worldly sacrifices? Are they ordinary sacrifices? Unacceptable sacrifices before the Lord? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. As you think about the leadership then, the leadership of the church. That's why you are here. You are a leader. And as you understand the priesthood in the word of God, and you begin to ask yourself, really, what kind of sacrifices am I offering to the Lord? Am I conscious of the fact that I'm part of the holy priesthood? As you come to verse 9, ye are a chosen generation. It's not every deacon Harry that is part of this priesthood. Even as you think about the whole church, it's not every creature, it's not every creation, it's not every man or woman that is part of this chosen generation. I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. I put you in place and ordained you that you may go forth and bear fruit. And there is a reason for the choice. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. It's telling us here that we're priesthood. We're also in the royalty. And as you begin to think about it now, the leadership of the church, and you're thinking about royalty, kingly character, royal character. As I look at leadership, are there times when leadership forgets royalty and we behave as if we are like the run of the mill, like street boys or street ladies, or street people, or ordinary people. Do we know the dignity of royalty? 
do we know that when it says royal priesthood, it puts some dignity on the leadership. And that tells about our comportment. Our attitude is a king of kings. And because he's a king of kings, he's a king with a capital K. And the way he responded to the father, it is royalty. It is dignity. You'll see the dignity of Jesus Christ Everywhere, it doesn't matter. You find him before Pilate, you find him before Caiaphas, you find him before Herod. You can see the dignity, the royalty of the king. In his quietness, on his speaking, in his action, in his miracle, in his comportment of himself. You can see the king in action. You can see, whenever there was agitation among the people, commotion among the people, and you see the Lord Jesus Christ moving on in the midst of the people, you can see royalty, you can see the kingly attitude, comportment, and character. And he is a king of kings, showing us, telling us, Demonstrating to us what we little, little kings in the royalty with little K shall behave. How we ought to act as under the authority, the control, the influence of our great king. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Is carving us out as a nation within another nation. People of God, children of God, you are a nation by yourself. And it's like a little circle in a bigger circle. It's like a little community in a greater community. And you are such a nation by yourself. You have laws. You have statutes. You have constitution. That guides your action. That guides everything that you do. And then it says, A peculiar people. Which means then that as we look at ourselves, The calling the Lord has given us, And we come into leadership in the church of the living God. A peculiar people that he should show forth, show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Tonight I'm talking to you on our consecrated service to the Lord. Our consecrated service to the Lord. There are three points we're going to look at. Number one, the submission of leaders to the Lord. The submission of leaders to the Lord. Number two, the separation of the laity unto the Lord. The laity, that's the congregation. The laity, that's the assembly of believers. The laity, those are the Followers, the separation of the laity unto the Lord. Number three, our sacrifice of love to the Lord. Our sacrifice of love to the Lord. Number one is our submission. The submission of leaders to the Lord. As you go through the New Testament... And you listen to the apostles. And you listen to the leaders of the early church. Over and over. They refer to themselves as the servants of the Lord. As the servants of God. As the servants of Christ. 
In fact, uh, the word translated servant a number of times in the epistles is the bond slave of the Lord. And although you might not have been living, you might not have lived at the time of a slave trade, but you can use your imagination and you can stretch your imagination. And think about the kind of unquestioning submission, obedience that slaves have to the master. And the final authority that the masters had in hand, even over the life, not only the action, over the lives of the slaves. Because those masters of those days of the Little Testament period, they owned the slaves, and their lives were like property to their masters. And as the leaders of the church, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers, and all category of leaders, as they looked at themselves, the way they saw themselves, they were born slaves to the Lord. That then will show you the kind of submission that leaders in the church have or ought to have unto the Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Paul, a servant of God, a bond slave of God, a slave of God that doesn't have any liberty of his own, any idea of his own, any opinion of his own, any desire of his own, a bond slave to God, that God owns him, owns his time, owns his life, owns his skills, owns all the ability that he has. And the Lord can deal with him as it pleases the Lord. And then an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle means the saint one. I belong to God, I belong to Jesus. And he can send me anywhere he wants to send me. No wonder. When Paul the Apostle and Barnabas, when they had been the Antioch church, and if you know anything about the New Testament church in the Acts of the Apostles, well, you take the church in Jerusalem, the next church in strength, the next church in strength, in ability, in power, the next church in numbers, the next church in resources, the next church in manpower was the church of Antioch. And what a great privilege to be a leader in the church at, and in Antioch. And then to be a teacher in Antioch. And to understand that in fact the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. What a wonderful thing to be one of the leaders, few leaders, very few of them, that are named, that are given by name in the church in Antioch. And then the Spirit said, separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I have appointed for them. Coming out of a big church like that, a great church like that, a conspicuous church like that, a church of note, a church of weight like that, and being sent out to a place where there was no church, fertile ground, new ground, break the ground there, no choir, no usher, no security, no finance, no church building, nothing. To be sent out like that into a virgin land. And there was no questioning. Why? Because I'm a slave. Paul knew. Barnabas knew. Because I'm a born servant. A born slave. 
And although I'm taking from the church of notes and the church of weight and the church of significance and the church of finance and the church of skill and the church of resources, and I'm sent out to a place where there are no resources, can I argue? No, sir. Can I complain? Not at all. Can I say, excuse me, Lord, my talents will be wasted in that place where there are no members at all. Over here, I'm a teacher, I'm a prophet, I'm a pastor, and a lot of counseling going on. How are you going to pick me up and send me there? Because I'm a servant of God. And a saint one, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, in the acknowledging of the truth and which is after godliness. That's the conception, that's the understanding of submission to the Lord by those early leaders in the church. And you know that God has not changed. The world may change, people may change, but God has not changed changed submission of the submission of the leaders to the Lord and you come to Jude and you come to verse 1 verse 1 of Jude Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. As you read that verse ordinarily, you, you have difficulty understanding. You, you read it on the surface. It will be like, oh, we have heard that before. And why do we have to read another reference and saying exactly the same thing as the one we read in Titus chapter 1? You don't understand. Jude here was one of the brothers, blood brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, don't you understand that Mary had other children and that his brothers and sisters, the brethren of the same mother, they did not believe on him while he was still on earth. Think about it. Jesus in the natural was older than them. But as they were being born, they were living in the same family. You remember that Jesus did not start the public ministry until the age of 30. All his brothers and sisters, blood brothers, they were watching his life. And you think about it, if you grow up in the same house or somebody... Five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, twenty-five years, you grew up in the same house. You probably slept in the same room. You probably ate on the same table. And uh, mommy probably sent both of you to go and do something together. And you know our brothers of the same blood brothers, blood sisters, you know they behave to one another. And then... Eventually, Jesus died, and he rose again. After he rose, he appeared unto the disciples, and he appeared unto his blood brothers and sisters. And they knew, our senior brother in the family is not an ordinary person, he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the King of Kings. All of a sudden they realize He is our Savior. Born by the same Virgin Mary. His own birth is different. He was born while Mary was still a virgin. But in our own case, we are born in the ordinary way. Here is Christ the Lord. Christ the King. Christ the Messiah. And they believed on the Lord. And then they became part of the leadership in the church, Jude and James, not the other James, not James, the brother of John. And now, as Jude was going to refer to himself, instead of introducing himself and saying, I am Jude, the junior brother of 
Jesus Christ. Born by the same mother. So you people should understand who I am. He said, I am Jude, the born slave of Jesus Christ. They forgot the human, earthly, natural attachment. How difficult sometimes it is. If somebody of the same mother with you, the same father with you, becomes the pastor or the leader, and all the idiosyncrasies and all the peculiarities and all the eccentricities, all the peculiar kind of traits of your senior brother, you know it very well. But now he happens to be your pastor or your leader in the church. Sometimes our attitude, we know all about him. We know all his eccentricities. We know all his peculiarities. We know all his whatever. And so, it affects our attitude. But here Jude said, I'm not a leader in the church. But as a leader above me, he is king. He is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. Is the Messiah, is the Savior of the world. I am a born slave to Him. Once again, please remember this submission of the church leaders in the early church to the Lord. And that's exactly how they demonstrated the understanding of what leaders in the church should do or should be, how they should act. As we look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, the Lord helps us to understand the desire of the Almighty God. What kind of attitude does He want from you, from me, as leaders in the church? What kind of consecration, commitment, submission, surrender does He want from also are leaders in the church unto himself. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, Saul of the Old Testament, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. It says, he raised unto them David to be their king. King David, do you have independent authority? No. I'm here because I'm to fulfill all his will. King David, now you are king, and you are exalted. What a high position you have. And you are an intelligent man, a wise man. Can you use your native wisdom? Can you use your acquired wisdom? Can you use your imparted wisdom and just keep on controlling the nation, controlling the world? It says no. I remain a king only as long as I remain a man at his own heart. And then I'm conscious every moment and every day, in every action, in every plan, that I am here to fulfill all his will. That's the desire of the Lord for the leadership. The leadership in the church. Remember, as David ruled over the nation, here we are leaders over the nation. This is a holy nation, a chosen generation, a peculiar people. And if the Lord has made us kings and priests in the household of faith, we're not here to do our will. We're not here to manifest independent wisdom. Earthly wisdom, personal wisdom, acquired wisdom, 
Psychological wisdom. Professional wisdom. We're here to do and to fulfill all his will. And then he tells us, as we look at the word of God in First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading verse 4. But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust of the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tries our hearts. And we do not uh, think that God has gone on vacation. He's gone on holidays. After all, He has appointed us. He has put us in place. And since the Lord has put us in place, He has abdicated His throne, His responsibility. He says, Now the ball is in your court. The work is in your hand. Go with it. Do whatever you please. No. We are brought into leadership. And we are now leaders in the household of faith. And we are acting. And we are ministering. And we are preaching. And we are organizing. And we are planning. Not as pleasing men. And you are one of the men. Yourself, you are the leader over there. God has put you in place. You are not to please, number one, this man, yourself. Number two, you are not to please the men around you. And you know sometimes uh, in leadership, very, very easily, the people in your church, in your local church, the people in your district, They may want to take the place of God. That they want to turn you in the direction you ought to go. And it's always somebody that wants to tell you, coordinator, this is the way to go. There's somebody that wants to tell you, group coordinator, that's the path to take. Because they want to take the place of God. As if they know what you ought to say. How you ought to say it. When you ought to say it. How long you ought to say it. And with what vocabulary you ought to say it. But it says, Paul the Apostle said, We're very conscious every time that the Lord has placed us in leadership. Not to please ourselves and not to please men, but to please God. Who tries our hearts. He keeps on trying our hearts. He puts us into leadership. And he wants us to all the time be conscious of the fact. That we are to be submissive unto him. As our king. As our lord. As the one that has appointed us. In Galatians chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal a son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not of flesh and blood. Paul the Apostle said, you know what? The very moment I was born again and converted to the Lord, I knew the implication. I knew that now, God is King. Christ is Lord of Lords. And that my whole life is not to be yielded to the Lord. And I'm not to confer with flesh and blood. And I'm not to be seeking for human opinion. And I'm not to be following human agenda. Immediately, I recognize the fact that now I'm born again. Now I'm I'm saved from sin. And I'm saved from self. 
and I'm saved from society, saved from sin. Sin is no more to reign over my life or to control me. I'm saved from self. Self is not to sit on the throne and be directing my life. I'm saved from society. Society is not to be controlling my life, influencing my life. There is one Lord. There is one King. There is one God. There is one Master. And He is to sit on the throne and to reign upon my life without a rival. That's the understanding Paul had, and that's the understanding we ought to have. Back up to verse 10. That's why he said in verse 10, but do I now pursue it, men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Christ already emphasized we cannot serve two masters. Either you choose one and reject the other. Or you hold on to one and refuse the other. But you cannot serve two masters. You cannot be under the control of the spirit and the flesh at the same time. Under the control of Christ the Lord and you yourself at the same time. You have to make a choice. If I yet please men, I should not be, I must not be, I cannot be the servant of Christ, the bond slave of Christ. That's the kind of submission the Lord is expecting in our preaching unto the Lord, in our planning everything unto the Lord, in our singing unto the Lord, in our ministering unto the Lord, in our counseling unto the Lord. In our giving unto the Lord. In our sacrificial ministry unto the Lord. Because all the time we're conscious of the fact that church leadership is actually servanthood or slavery. If you use that word, they used it in New Testament. Slavery, born slaves unto the Lord. We belong to the Lord. Uh, that's the reason why. As you are a real servant of the Lord, and you are serving the Lord, it is a desire in your heart that you will serve Him more, you will obey Him more, you will fulfill His will more, that you will be able to look at you and look at your ministry, and you will be able to say, here is my beloved child, here is my uh, beloved one, in whom I am well pleased, in Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Uh, when you read that, sometimes you jump ahead into the interpretation. Because you do not understand, there is a primary interpretation. Number two, there is a prophetic implication. Number one, there is a primary interpretation. If you look at the title of Psalm 40, you will see that this is a psalm of David. And then you remember that God said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, and have appointed him. He shall fulfill all my will. And David was conscious of that. I'm chosen to be a leader. And in the choice of being a leader, I'm to be absolutely, completely, entirely submissive unto the Lord. And in the primary interpretation, it's David saying, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, yes, truly, in reality, thy law is within my heart. That's number one, the primary interpretation. Number two, the prophetic implication. 
This is applicable to the Lord Jesus Christ. We find him many times saying, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. We find him saying, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. We find him praying, not my will, but thine be done. The prophetic implication. So then, as you recognize that it's the Lord himself who has appointed you to be a leader, the submission, the consecration, the Lord is expecting from you unto himself. And that's the reason to require real prayer. That the Lord will subdue self, will crush self, will take whatever it is within us that's always wanting to rule our lives, guide our lives, think the way we want to think, even in the work of God. That wants to push the Almighty God to one side, that I might be on the throne. But to be able to pray, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Psalm 143, verse 10. Psalm 143, verse 10. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. That's the prayer we ought to pray. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Teach me to do your will. And lead me in the right path. Into the land of all brightness. The submission of leaders to the Lord. Number two. The separation of the laity unto the Lord. The separation of of the laity unto the Lord. If leaders are who they ought to be, the laity will be what they ought to be. If the preachers, the pastors, the coordinators, the group coordinators, the zonal leaders, the women reps, the women coordinators, and the sexual leaders, if the leaders are what they ought to be, the followers will be what they ought to be. There's a principle here now. The centurion was talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he was saying, You know why I believe in your authority? Do you know why I believe that if you will speak the word, my servant will be healed? Because I am a man under authority. And then I also exercise authority over the soldiers that are under me and because I am submissive to the authority above me the authority below me is submissive to me I'm a man under authority I act under authority I give commands under authority I live under authority I'm always in subjection and submissiveness to authority, the authority above me. I am a man under authority. And because I'm a man under authority, I also say to this one, go, and he goes. Come, and he comes. I stay under authority because of that I manifest authority. And because I know you, Jesus, you are not the authority of your father. And because you never come out of authority, you're always in submission to your father. That's why I believe the demons and the sicknesses will be under your authority. If you tell them, go, they'll go. If you tell them, get out of there, they'll get out of there. What a wonderful principle this is. If we are in submission to the Lord... And we are under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we understand our calling. And we are not independent of the Lord. And we are in submission to the authority of our King, of our Master, of our Lord. His name is Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. Then, 
the work in the church will be easy for you. You are under authority. Because of that, you manifest authority and the followers and the people that are being led and the children of God and the members in the church, they will be under the authority of the Lord too. They see the example from you. They see the pattern and the model from you. And so, the laity, the followers, they will be able to follow you as you follow Christ. That leads us to this, number two, the separation of the laity unto the Lord in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's very good that you read these words yourself. And just sit down and relax and pick up these words one by one. Reasonable service. Is my service reasonable? Is it worthy? Is it acceptable? If my service is going to be reasonable, there are some things that are reaching here. I'll present my body unto God. Do I ever think about it? The actions of my hand, the movement of my lips, the motion of my feet, the thought that produces action in my life. Are they submitted to God? Are they yielded to God? It's only then when my actions and my thoughts are offered unto the Lord as a sacrifice that my service is reasonable, my ministry is reasonable. When I do not allow my ministry, my action, my thoughts to be stained with fleshly wisdom, to be colored with earthly stain or dirt, when I allow, allow everything I do to be a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. And I offer it totally unto the Lord. Those Israelites, whenever they offer their sacrifice to the Lord, they were not dividing it between them and the Lord. Lord, Look at this old sacrifice. Do you mean you want to have everything? Which one will belong to me if you have everything? Lord, let's share it. They offered the sacrifice wholly, entirely, completely unto the Lord. And as members of the church, we're leaders who are members. You cannot be a leader if you are not a member. And you cannot continue to be a leader if you do not continue to be a member. As we consider the laity and the separation and the surrender of the laity, the sacrifice of the laity unto the Lord, you offer everything unto the Lord without argument with the Lord. That makes your service to be reasonable, acceptable before the Lord in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. The Lord is just simply telling us. He told the children of Israel. He said, Israel, you are going into the land. Those people have their gods. And there is a way they offer their sacrifices to their gods. Do not learn their ways. The Lord is telling us the same thing here. It's telling us if our service, if our ministry, if our sacrifice is going to be acceptable to the Lord, do not learn the ways of the world. 
There is a way the people of the world serve their gods. They serve their masters. Whether it is civil, secular, master, or it is idolatrous, traditional God, that's the way they do it. Don't learn it. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The separation and the surrender of the laity unto the Lord in First Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen, verse twenty. Watch. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. You are bought with a price. Are you ever conscious of the fact that you do not belong to yourself? You have been redeemed, you have been bought, you have been purchased. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God, which are God's. You are not God's property. You cannot use your mind any way you want, your brain any way you want, your hand any way you want, your body any way you want, your time any way you want. You belong to God. And you are to do everything now in submission. To the commandment of the Lord in submission to everything the Lord desires and demands. It tells us in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, looking at verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. If you are going to do that, it's going to be a conscious act. Lord, I lay this on the altar. Do you know that many times, many members of our body will act almost with, without our control. We call it reflex action. That your hands are used to doing something. And sometimes without even thinking about it, your hand goes ahead to do that. Sometimes there are, you know, some natural, natural things that they do not have any spiritual value. Like all the time your hand is going to your head and scratching your head and you are not even thinking about it. Without you knowing that you have done it, except somebody tells you. And sometimes the way you stand... You stand on one leg because maybe earlier that leg is stronger than the other. And you do it now without even thinking. You don't have a choice. You just do it. All those ones are immaterial. All those ones, they do not have any spiritual value. Those are natural, natural things. But there are some things that have spiritual value. They have spiritual weight. And we do them without even thinking we're doing them. Because in our careless moments, in our unconsecrated time, in our thoughtless moments, we had done those things, it had become a habit. And the Lord is saying, all that you acquired in your thoughtless moment, in your unguarded time, in your unconsecrated time, that you are not submitting members of your body and your life unto me, and it's affecting your service unto the Lord. Why don't you turn around and sit down and say, I dare some things in my ministry, in my life, that I do, and I'm not offering my energy, my members, my life unto the Lord as a living sacrifice. That's why it says here that you yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. If that is going to be the case, there is the implication then you are not going to yield that thing to the world, to sin, to self, to society. First John chapter 2. In First John chapter 2 verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And the Lord is calling you to conscious action. He is calling you to an act of the will. Love not the world. He is telling you that you take a deliberate stand. You make up your mind in a deliberate way. And you search your will. You set your mind against the things of the world. Against the pattern in the world. And the practice of the world. You do it deliberately. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, submission to God again. He that doeth the will of God, total submission unto God once again. He that doeth the will of God, he that owns the Lord as the only master. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, Master Jesus. In my life, reign. Come and reign without a rival. Not that I give part of my time, part of my heart, part of the control of my life to somebody, to a man, or to a group of people, or to Satan, or to the flesh, or to self, or to carnality. And I give part to the Lord. No. That's is requesting, is demanding for total, entire, complete submission unto himself. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In the prayer of the Lord Jesus for his own disciples, in John chapter 17, John chapter 17, you look at verse 6 before you go to verse 14. John 17 verse 6. I manifested thy name unto the men. which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were. By creation. Thou gavest them me. Redemption. They have kept thy word. Verse 14. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not for them. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But that thou shouldest keep them from evil. Father, you cannot kill them, make them die, take them out of the world in the physical, naturally. Because I need them to do the work, to preach the word. To fulfill the ministry. To carry out the great commission. Don't take them out of the world. But while they are in the world, the consciousness that they belong to you, implant it in them. And protect them and preserve them from the evil tendencies of the world. That they do not submit themselves to the world. That the world will not become the Lord, the King, the Master, the control, the influence over them. Keep them from the evil in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And that's what the Lord is expecting from those who are members of the body of Christ, those who belong to the Lord, that 
the whole church, the membership of the church, were to be so separated from the world, were separated unto the Lord in subjection to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Therefore, as this church is subject unto Christ, the church submissive to Christ, that's the laity, the members and the ministers together, the leaders and the laity together, the church, the whole church, submissive, putting their neck under the yoke of the Lord, unto the Lord all the time. Number one is the submission of the leaders to the Lord. Number two is the separation of the laity unto the Lord. Number three now, the sacrifice of love to the Lord. The sacrifice of love to the Lord. If there is anything the Lord is going to accept from us, it's going to be the sacrifice of love. And if we do not sacrifice or give sacrificially, or live sacrificially, if our ministry is the ministry of convenience, we do not understand the very basic primary rudiment of call into the ministry. We do not understand the A, B, C, the alphabet of the call into the ministry. If our ministry does not have sacrifice, if it's a ministry of convenience, a ministry of, I cannot go beyond that point. I know my strength. I know my ability. I know my limitation. I can't overdrive myself. I know my constitution. I know the kind of body I'm carrying about. And I cannot go beyond this point. If anybody is recording anything beyond this point, please take your work. If we're like that, and it's a ministry of convenience, we do not know the basic alphabet of a call into the ministry. The call into the ministry requires sacrificial love to the Lord for the lost. In Philippians chapter 3, let's see one of our leaders understanding the very reason for the call. Understanding what it means to be called into the ministry. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ. You know there are people that the thing they have submitted or surrendered. There are things that actually would have ruined their lives if they kept them. Negative things. I've thrown away my cigarette. You need to do that for your health. I've thrown away my bottles of beer. You need to do that for your health. That's for your good. Those are negative things. I've thrown away all the magic, occultism, and everything. You need to do that. Because if you're involved in those things, Satan will be oppressing your life. will attack your life and destroy you. It's dangerous for your life. I've given up adultery, of course, as quickly as possible. You ought to do that. Apart from the judgment of God, if the husband of that woman knows that you are going out with his wife, he can get you know, out of his senses and take a cutlass and chop off your head. You need to give up that adultery as quickly as possible. I gave up fornication. You must. You must. There is HIV, AIDS traveling about and knocking at every door. You must give up that. That's negative. The kind of things that people think that I've given this up, I've given this up. They are negative things. But here now, we're talking about things that could have been serviceable, profitable, and very useful. And Paul the Apostle said, now I understand. 
the call into the ministry. Sacrificial love. It says, what things were gain unto me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things. And not even the things that I can pinpoint that this one gained to me, this one gained to me, this one gained to me. All things, I count them, but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, of Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. The privilege to even be in a church like this, that the Lord reveals himself through the word. That even if we were not leaders, even if we were not preachers, even if we did not have the privilege of leading other people, just to be allowed to sit down and get into the knowledge of Christ, and get into the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the knowledge of Christ, and partake of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Just that. And Paul the Apostle said, think about it. As I've been privileged to go, I'm talking about uh, Paul, to the third heavens. And I heard, and I saw things that no way I could have heard, I could have seen, I could have partaken of them. Just that. Even for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I forsake every other thing. I give up every other thing. And I'm willing to run the extra mile. In self-denial. In sacrifice. Because of the privilege of having, being exposed to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. When you understand the knowledge of Christ Jesus and the excellency and the beauty and the glory of the excellency of the knowledge of the Lord, you'll do the same thing as Paul did. It's because the Lord is not as glorious to some people as he was to Paul. That's why they belittle the privilege. That's why they cannot give up the things that were gained to them. Uh, sometimes you might ask one of our leaders, how is it you are not at the Tuesday meeting? And they will say, you know, really, there is a lot of workload on me in my office. And, you, you know, my time nowadays, I really have to watch what I do. And I have to watch where I go. I have to watch what I get involved in. Because, you know, nowadays, there are a lot of priorities that I need to set and put in place. And by the time I think about doing this and doing this and doing this, um, the Tuesday meeting, I wish I could make it. But at present, it's, it's so difficult. What things were gained to me? Those I counted laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And at this present time now, I still do count them, but don't, that I may win Christ. That's why this St. Paul the Apostle said in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things moved me. Uh, you know, somebody came and he was uh, prophesying. And as they prophesied everywhere he went, you know, prophesying that you are going to be bound in Jerusalem. You are going to have real, real difficulty in Jerusalem. And uh, your life is in danger in Jerusalem. He said in verse 23, the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, in every city, that bonds and afflictions abide me, waiting for me, trouble waiting for me. And then Paul the Apostle said, but none of these things move me. 
neither count I my life dear to myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. That's sacrificial love. And that's what the Lord is expecting from you and from me, from everyone. In Second Samuel, chapter twenty-four. Second Samuel, chapter twenty-four, verse twenty-four. The middle part there. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, my God, of that which cost me nothing. Cheap service, not me. Uh, something that cost me nothing, convenient service, not me. A ministry of convenience, cheap, that my flesh does not feel the pain. My bank account does not feel the pain. And my time does not feel the pressure, not me. I'm not going to offer to anything to the Lord that costs me Nothing. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that if we know who God is, and we know what Christ has done, we're going to come back to the altar fresh. And we're going to say, Lord, we're very sorry for all the cheap, cheap services. Service of no value. Service that does not carry the cross. Service. That does not cost anything. Service of convenience. That we may offering to the Lord. Lord, we are very sorry. We may not think as if we are the Lord of our lives. And the captain of our souls. And we are the directors of our career. We have not handed everything over to you. But Lord, we come today. Understanding. If our service is going to be acceptable to the Lord. There will be consecration. There will be surrender. Absolute surrender. There will be, number one, the submission of this leader unto the Lord entirely, without reservation, without question. Number two, there's going to be the separation of the laity, of the membership, and you included, all of us included, the separation unto the Lord. There's going to be the sacrifice of love unto the Lord. Rise up and let us pray. And we're going to pray. We're not in a hurry. We're going to offer our time to the Lord in prayer. All the unacceptable service of Rosh Rosh Rosh.